And now to kick off the Brev level evaluations, we've got a great score here by Carrie Robles. And yeah, I just really enjoyed this, Carrie. You've come so far in your uh, your understanding of instrumentation and your you know your sense of proportion and and your approach. It just really is refreshing. And this. This score is just so much fun. I mean, I think that there's a few things to clean up about it, but it it really plays very well mentally as I look at it. And I mean, there's a lot of fixing up that you need to do uh, before you were to put this onto music stands uh, for a live orchestra. But it's still very cool. Okay, so you know, we're starting off with this, and I just really love these little touches here. The little F sharp there, and that one there, um, yeah, and and just very very brisk wind scoring right in here, and it, the only thing I would say here is you need to tell us how many instruments are playing. Is this a two flutes? Is this one flute? Right. It, it seems to all be really kind of scored just for single instruments um, so far. Right. So so you have to tell us how many of each. Right. I mean, with this, I would say single winds would be probably the best approach, right? Um, this could be the second and that could be the first. Um, you know, and that, that could be the second and that could be the first player. So yeah, it's 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 really up to you, but but you have to let us know <clears throat> on this first page just, you know, what what are what's going on. Then there's some kind of strange um, notation here like this you know i don't i don't i don't know what this does for the music like the decrescendo here this uh, diminuendo hairpin i don't see how that helps anything right it, to you know to my mind you would you don't want to mess with the harp in fact i would mark it mezzo forte to have it stand out from this texture it won't be hard to hear and it will be nicely you know it'll it'll work nicely with the uh the flute is not going to get in the way of the harp and neither are these uh, softer violins, right? And viola thrown in there. Uh, but still, it's just, it needs to be louder in order to balance. <clears throat> uh, uh, yeah, so just a few weird things in here. See, I would give, <clears throat> I would give these uh, two sis, uh, sta staff systems, sorry, excuse me, uh, uh, beam groups. I would give these two to the second violin, right? And then just have the viola come in here. Because this is just sort of fussy, right? It's really a, you know, it's really a second violin part, right? And, you know, nicely, you know, nicely kind of interlocking and and playing over the, the uh, first violin, which you can get away with because you've got the flute above doubling the uh, first violin at an octave, right? And you could just switch all of these around. You could have 
this in the seconds, this in the firsts, and and that would also work. And just, you know, kind of going on like pretty high bassoon writing. People are kind of taking all this for granted, but it will still work. It's just that it's a little strange because you've got it doubling with the flutes, right? So you've got flute and bassoon doubling, and that can be a very cool sound. Uh, and I do like the way that you go to the G here and the uh, the D sharp there. Okay, so I mean that all works fairly well. You know, then you've got um, like a unison melody here, uh, flutes. See, here's where we really need to know, right? I mean, is this a two flutes against a two clarinets, or is it one of each, or is it two two flutes plus one clarinet? You really have to make all those decisions right there, right? Um, yeah, but I mean, seeing as how some of it's doubling the strings, it's it's really no big deal. I like this nice high cello scoring, but you really should be putting in a um, uh, a tenor clef right here. That is really, um, I don't know, I don't know. you know, I would, well, you know what I would do here is I would leave out this note and then go pizzicato there. So just like this. Uh, delete that, and then back that off, right? And then pizzicato. It's just it'll just you get way better results. Uh, I mean, not that this, not that what you scored originally is impossible or anything. It's just it's just better, you know. It's just better, better uh, with the bow, right? Because you because you have to think that this is going to be, like the player will probably do this with an up bow so that their finger is close to where it is going to go pizzicato there, right? So up bow, then pluck, up bow, pluck. Right, it just will make it a, le a little easier, but it's still kind of weird um, if you don't fix it a little bit. But you know, good to have clarinets in A and everything else. Now this was really nice. Uh, the flutes. Um, let's let's say that this is A2, and then oboes and clarinets beefing up the. Uh, the first and second violins. See, this will make a difference just because it is a. It's piano crescendo, and it is like it could be anywhere up to four wind instruments here pushing into this, and then just letting go right here, and just allowing just straight wind wind tone to play, and then coming in right at the end. Uh, now I'm not so sure how much tremolo you can really get at that high speed. Do you know what I mean? And then here you've got um, flutter tonguing. Okay, now the flutter tonguing is going to work great for the piccolo and for the uh, for the flutes. Not so great for the oboe. Do you know what I mean? I, I don't know if you've heard flutter tonguing on the oboe. There's some in uh, the Rite of Spring and I mean it's it's you know it, it is not really like this is such a smooth lyrical piece um, you know just very carefully proportioned and and um, and everything like that. It just it just this is going to honk and sort of sound kind of slightly hilarious if it's audible at all, right? So better to leave the uh, the flutter tonguing to the flute and piccolo unless you really want a s really specific effect. And this is totally not to say that oboists can't do flutter tonguing, but it just is, you know, it's just way better on flute. It's, you know, it's like you might as well not even score it for oboe if you're having the flute do it as well on the same pitches. Okay, but... But other than that, you know, other than there barely being enough time to really do an effective tremolo, um, it's still pretty cool. And then I, I love the way that the um, that the oboe and clarinet come in here, and then just kind of basically um, you know, transition into this uh, cadence. That's all really great. I, I don't know who's got the <laughs> who's got the crescendo there, right? Watch out. Okay. Um, and, you know, seeing as how you don't have horns or anything playing the, uh, uh, you know, playing this this cadence in here, you don't really have to worry about overplaying the flutes in their low register. Pretty much you are taking that into account. So that's pretty good. Okay, and that just le leads us to here. And this is going to be a little less optimum than you think. I'm seeing a lot of scoring like this for bassoon where um, you know you really got the 
you know, one player pretty high and the other players, you know, or excuse me, where you've got the bassoonist fairly high. It might be better to like split this across, um, across two players, like basically have the, have the first bassoonist go, but a dum, but a dum, but a dum, right? And then have the second player go, but da da da, right? Da 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 da. So first, then right here you dovetail to second, dun dun dun. That's a much better way of dividing it up, right? As opposed to just, it's just more effective. Or you could have this part right here played by clarinet and then the other part played by bassoon. But just, you know, notice, I mean, there's nothing wrong with high notes on the bassoon, but they're just not very, you know, they're not rapid and elegant and, and you know, they're not rapid fire like we you have right in here. And, but anyways, this is setting up something very, very cool um, and, and so it's, it's really nice to get just like starting off with pizzicato, the end of that smooth line and the oboe and the clarinet, and then just kind of going straight to the winds and, and, you know, fairly nicely scored too, just like having those flute and oboe unisons leading straight to this very swirling sounding, uh, violin part in here. This should be playable. It's, it's, it's pretty hard, but it should be playable. I would say, I mean, you know, a good violinist should be able to do that, but it's, yeah, it's, yeah, um, just way up high there, just really covering a lot of ground. It's going to be tricky, okay? There's some stuff coming up here that's probably not possible, but we will cover that when we get to it. Um, but, but yeah, but I mean, kind of cool to throw the, uh, the accompaniment part upside down. This would be a lot more playable, like an octave lower, but it's it's kind of cool the way that you've got it there. I mean, you could even divide this up divisi, kind of like I was, I was suggesting with the bassoons on the previous page. Um, but yeah, you know, they've got this unison violas and and second violins. I think this all works really, really great, so long as you know that the players are good enough to play this. That kind of swirling sound is, you know, just so prized with um, with cinematic scoring. Like you've got it in, um, like I think the most the most notorious example of that is the uh, um, the Hedwig's theme from uh, John Williams' score to the first couple of uh, of Harry Potter movies, which has now just become iconic. You know. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's gonna, you're going to have that same kind of feeling if you're going that fast. And then, of course, supporting from below by the clarinets is ingenious because it, it you know, the, the overtones are going to kind of push to push upwards, you know, into the violins. Um, and then, you know, you've got these, you've got this sudden surge here and you've got harp, right? So the harp would need to be fortissimo. Uh, I mean, if there was any way to add pizzicato or mallets, like, say, uh, xylophone or marimba or some other kind of thing instead of harp there, then I would I would say go for it. Do you know what I mean? Because the harp is just probably not quite strong enough to to make a significant difference there. The sound set is is totally a liar. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, the harp is just going to disappear into this if the players are playing strong enough. Okay. And then, right, and then we've got the clarinet coming in, and I think this is just really beautiful, right? And this is this is a, an example of where you could definitely divide up, like, first and second clarinet, right? This could all be second clarinet, and then the first clarinet could come in here and play this lovely solo, right? And then maybe they could come in and do A2 right over here. Okay, uh, but it is really nice that, like, you are, you know, you've got flute, See, this, this will work, okay, so long as everybody is just really paying attention here. I would say A2 on the flutes, okay, um, and then the it's really important that the clarinet does not overplay this so that, you know, it could easily bury the flute, but it is possible to balance there. Okay, and then we've got the unison of violas and cellos. And here's another place where I think you could divide it up between the parts. You could have the violas going ba dum ba dum ba dum and the cellos going dugga 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 you know, um, below, right? Okay, so, I mean, this is all possible. Going to treble clef here, that's pretty easy for the, uh, for the violas. And that's not a bad place to jump up to 
treble clef. But are you really sure that you want to send your cellos all the way up to that E? Do you know what I'm saying? It's like, like, wow, that is such high scoring. And like, there's nothing in between. Did you originally intend for this to be an octave lower, like say this? So I'm just going to delete that and go like this. Is that what you intended originally? Do you know what I mean? Because that makes a whole lot more sense. Right? It's just, that's way more balanced. But there's no way that the, the cellos are going to be able to jump up there and play it the way that you had it written before. Right? And then, th then here you kind of keep the octave. You have a part that interacts with the bassoon, you know, uh, doubling on some notes. Right? And still in harmonizing on others. You have something that is an octave away from the double bass from time to time and it more fully supports so just let me know whether or not I was right about that because it just seems you know you're usually much more careful than that Carrie so I, I just you know can't imagine that that you intended the cellos to be suddenly playing in treble clef like that and the and the, of course the treble clef goes on onto the next page so I've now corrected it to bass clef but we will just see how things are going on the next page all right so yeah, so here you go to harp, similar to the way that I did, um, you know, and then this, I really love this last little uh, beam group of support. That's nice. That's really nice. Okay, and then, yeah, and then you just, you know, clarinets and bassoons, keeping it low. That's all very, very, very cool. And and the part that was leading up to it is also nicely scored. Um, you know, oboes. Yeah, you know, at this point you're starting to play loudly, so the flute is just completely not even needed until you get to right here, right? And nobody's going to hear it. So, I would say have the flute come in right here, right, and then continue on. That's a much better way to, you know, to blend together. I mean, because look, you've got the clarinets anyways, right? I mean, what do you need to double with flute here? Right? Nobody's going to hear the flute, right? Anything below middle C, or sorry, excuse me. Anything below C in the staff is going to be invisible. Now this part here is really, really nice. I love the, um, you know, the, the really widely spread harmony here. That is something that I didn't see too often. Uh, just, you know, just really exposed uh, harmony at, at a tenth, right, instead of just at thirds. That was very, very cool. And what's nice about it is that the overtones of the bassoon are going to sit right under the flute right there and it is going to create the illusion that they're closer together than they really are and this I thought was ingenious just to have the oboist jump up and trill on that um, it it means that the flutist does not have to trill if that's what that's you know you wanted to add that to that part just the oboe is giving that little bit of buzz right in there and it blends just enough at the beginning then afterwards let's go that is really really great scoring Carrie I mean that's something that I I would have wished that I'd thought of in some other scoring thing that I've done. So, yeah. Now, the harp is continuing to do its arpeggios, right? Um, and, yeah, so you're, like, kind of giving it... So, like, where's it? So you're saying E natural here, but, like, there was an E natural here, right? Okay, and then... Right in here, you throw in an E flat and a C natural. So this is kind of doable. I, I almost wonder if you could like, I mean, it, it doesn't really matter to the harpist whether they're playing this or not, but here's where they're going to have to make the change, right? They're going to have to change to E flat and they're going to have to change to like the C natural. That can happen like over here. And then the E flat would have to be snuck in right around here. So this is playable. If there was any way to kind of like just stop right here and just allow the second violins to kind of carry it for a second so that there isn't any sound of um, of strings changing pitch, right? Which is, which is something that is just like the bane of existence for the harpists. Um, you know, I just wish there was some enharmonic way of stating this, but your D is tied up and your F is tied up, and it's just like you got the E flat changing to E natural in the middle, so like the harpist kind of has to go in between the two things. So it's it's tricky. It just really is tricky. Um, 
you know, if there was a way of stating this without the E flat, then that would be what to do, I guess. Um, this is going to be a little tricky for the bassoonist, but not too difficult. It's just not going to be very clear. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's, but it's still okay. Um, I like that little touch there. And then, of course, you have clarinet uh, playing along with your, um, you know, right? like here you're, you're losing the harmonization, which is a little concerning. Do you know what I mean? Because this is, um, this clarinet part is a concert pitch, right? So, um yeah, it just would be better if you had kept up the kept the harmony going, and then here you let go of it completely. All right, what's up with that? All right, why couldn't you continued like harmonizing on some of these things? So you know that's that that's my drawback. It's you know like just just to continue on what whatever you were doing before. I mean that was such a great idea. Why was it? Why did it not continue happening? But oh well, so. Um, and then, you know, this is all very, very cool. The, you know, this is, this is fine. No big problems there. I like the, uh, I like the sort of, uh, Arco being answered by Pizzicato and see like here you got this part just way too high, right? This, this is, I mean, this is possible, but like the Pizzicato, that Pizzicato on, on cello, you know, why bother, right? Cause, cause it's the same exact part as this, right? So if you were to just drop this an octave, right? This is back when you had your cello part in treble clef, so maybe you weren't thinking, right? So if you're down here, that's all great. That's all totally playable and cool and everything else, right? And then here, um, yeah, I mean, it's just very close to the viola part. And now you like, look, your viola part is in treble clef. So look, um, see, like there's a lot better stuff that you could be doing here, you know, more cautious approaches. If you get used to scoring viola and treble clef, then you're always going to have it too high and you're just not going to be supporting enough, right? You're going to tell it to do things like, I mean, actually, this is a very cool part, what you've got in here. But once again, just really high in terms of like the cello scoring, right? What if it was like this and then you'd have the parts in octaves? Right, and then it would be a really, really great complement to what's going on here. That was that was really nice. And the same thing here. Right, and here you got pizzicato tied, like Divisi. Um, that doesn't really make any sense, right? Just because pizzicato doesn't tie, it disappears almost immediately. What to do is just to have this note here, get rid of the tie, kill the top note, boom. Right. That's what you want. Okay, but I mean, I otherwise, I really did like this sort of, um, you know, mini apotheosis. And yeah, same thing here. I would say just just bring your bring your bassoon scoring down a bit there. Okay. But otherwise, this will all work great. And this should have been a place where you could put in some retardando, right? Let's take a look at the next section. Okay, so now we get to the B section and maybe inadvertently or maybe intentionally, I, I'm not sure which, but there's some really great scoring on here, just like, it, just in terms emotionally. Um, so, all right, so not to get ahead of myself, um, we've got viola and flutes doubling and actually that is a pretty cool idea. Uh, you know, viola and flute is just really has a has, has a wonderful. Um, there's a lovely unity, and you don't push the violas too high here, so that's really great, Carrie. That's, that's really nice. Okay, and then you've got, you know, you've got these um, these just long tones in here uh, from uh, the first and second violins, and then you've got this octave here in the bass. And then, like, all the motion really is in, like, harp and, like, the middle winds. Then you've got this little contrary motion here uh, in the bassoons and harp. See, this should have been regular, right? You should have thrown in the bassoon here as well, right? Just, like, the same um, contrapuntal line. And, and, like, and then had another, like, had that continued on with that same sense of counterpoint and had more harmonization, right? You've got two flutes, 
right? You've got violas that you could go divisi. You could have put those thirds in here, right? You really just had many more voices working here. And, you know, this is really, really cool what you do with the clarinets, right? You know, trading off with the oboes and everything else with these longer tones. But, like, and once again, you could have had, like, more harmony in there. Do you know what I mean? And it would have just made this whole uh, passage just glow. Uh, I mean, I really do like the um, the harp right in here. That's a good way to just to bring that out. Um, you know, that too could have been, uh, you know, could have been doubled by, say, Divisi cello or, or you know, parts of it could have been doubled by, like, one of the clarinets or, I mean, there's a lot that you could do here. Um, but, but I really do love the peaceful feeling that you've got here. And then this is just, uh, this is just like, I, I maybe you just had, like, Maybe you just had uh, long tied notes because you couldn't figure out what else to do, but whatever. It works, okay? It works great. It just really feels like the whole music is floating away on a cloud here. And, of course, that we sort of sacrifice the uh, the sort of motoristic quality, that you know, the sense of being a sewing machine. But it just is wonderful, you know? Just really, the music just releases in a kind of an effortless way. I think that's just, I think it's amazing. It just, just is, you know, something I would have never have occurred to me Okay, and that was just a great idea. And then you're having the, the, um, the sort of bustling lines just sort of transfer over into different instruments. Okay, and this is a pretty powerful unison. You know, just I mean, the, nobody's. I mean, that yeah, the flutes just don't even matter until right around this A, right? And same thing is true for the piccolo. But I mean, the piccolo is very, it's very gentle. You might, you know, the better thing to do is to have the. This is what I would do. All right, you really want to maintain this. All right, this is an idea you like. Okay, so what I would do is that just have the um, the the flute doubling the piccolo right there, where it's incredibly weak, right, and getting out of the way of the oboe, and then just you can go back to unison with oboe right there. But yeah, I mean, just, just such a cool idea, and then and then keeping things kind of soft and relaxed. That's also very cool. And then you just kind of come down from the cloud right here, and and that's all really really nice. Okay, so yeah, and just like the you've got like your octave um, melody right in here, and just the fluttering winds coming down. I mean, there's a lot you could have done with that idea as an orchestrator you didn't have to follow the the exact way that this was scored you know you could have just had trills and other kinds of things bird singing right this seems to be the direction that you're going in there okay uh now we get to this big climax here and you know once again we just like stripped all the harmony out right you could have put in put in harmony like you got two flutes you got two oboes you could have filled this in right with big chords if you wanted to all right um so yeah, the function in the bass here was really weird, okay? And then, yeah, and sort of, it just kind of didn't hold together. So this is this is kind of a job for your counterpoint teacher, all right? Just kind of working out some of these issues. Um, yeah, and then like the whole sense of kind of going back and forth between the chords, that probably could have been handled a little bit better, just, you know, in terms of like, Maybe not, instead of repeating back and forth here, you could have gone in between instruments or in between registers, right? And it might have been a lot more effective. Here, this is not realistic. The harp is just, you know, once you have figured out all the scoring in here, the harp will just disappear, right? But maybe a downward glissando here uh, to kick off these downward swooping runs. That would have been very nice. Yeah, so, so here, it's kind of interesting you did a... Um, you didn't put slurs on your flute and kind of wondering if that was intentional. You could have put like staccato marks on here and then really brought it out because it really, you could really hear it above everything else. And then I would say also put staccatos on the, on the string parts too, to just, just to kind of accent that, you know, just that makes a lot of sense. And then you're kind of going into sort of resting mode here. Uh, so yeah, so I mean, the, the ending is like both very powerful and has a lot of things that need to be fixed, <laughs> right? Um, 
There are lots of minor things like that change of clef in the cellos and maybe forgetting where you were and, you know, and maybe intending to be an octave lower, which I sort of fixed for you here in the score. But I mean, just really like you just have a really strong idea of what you want in your head, Carrie. It really shows. And, um, you know, I mean, just keep at it. It's really, you know, just I mean, it's, it was an honor to to teach you as part of the MOOC course. And it's just really great to see your scoring getting better and better. And and just really happy for the effort that you're able to put into some of these things. So thank you so much for being a part of this uh, challenge. It's really great to actually see your score first uh, in this um, in this collection of Brev scores. So yeah, so it's great. So you know, please enter the 2020 orchestration challenge. I think you'll really enjoy that piece that I have got selected. It's just completely different from this piece and has other challenges in it that I can't wait to see you uh, take on.